Hello, I'm Abhijit Banerjee, I'm taking over from Esther. Um, we're going to continue uh, these lectures. The topic that I'm going to take on today is, is trade. Uh, and uh, what you might notice on this, on this slide, if you're used to reading in English, is the play on words. Um, there is enormous, enormous uh, talk about the gains from trade and perhaps, I mean, part of the point I'm going to make is less about the pains from trade and there's a sense in which maybe the, those gains are sometimes overstated and certainly we are too inclined to forget the pains. And I think, so this is not only about the uh, pains from trade, but it is an attempt to restore the balance that's sort of I think needed. Uh, there is a sense in which the world is too, too happy to talk about the gains without talking about the pains. Um, now trade is always in a sense been a, a political issue. In fact, uh, economics, uh, in many ways, modern economics was invented by thinking about trade. So it's a, it's a point I'll come back to. I'll, 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 we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the history of trade thinking uh, in a bit. But I, I think that it's what's, what's extremely important to keep in mind is that debates about trade have always been there. The post Second World War period maybe in a sense was the exception, the one period where there was a relatively stable consensus that you know, free trade is good and then countries that didn't participate in free trade um, mostly were seen as losers and many of them eventually accepted free trade, China, India uh, being prominent examples. So it, it was seen as being a period of quiet triumph for free trade. Uh, what changed in the last maybe decade but increasingly in the last maybe in the last five years is the fact that suddenly what was I think seen as being a kind of a, a given started unraveling. There was just much more conversation. Uh, you know you know about Brexit um, and the all the deals that were supposed to happen between Britain and the and the European community which didn't happen or didn't quite uh, happen and then last moment some compromise was reached. You, you know, Trump was of course famously both famous for both vituperating against China and talking about tariffs. Uh, at the same time from a very different political angle there's been more pressure to think about the consequences of, of trade both on the environment and on uh, the ability of countries to uh, countries like France to, stay, to sustain their social com compromise. That in some ways the fact that there is very poorly paid laborers who are, they are, comp who are competing with French labor is often seen as a threat to the French uh, ability of the French uh, economy to sustain the wages that they want to sustain and relatedly uh, the kind of the uh, restrictions on quality of goods um, uh, are often seen as being uh, you know unfair competition for the, in, the higher internal standards that France maintains but then in reverse sometimes the French standards f for imports are, uh, are accused of being ways of excluding foreigners, foreign suppliers. So there is a, it's a suddenly both from the left and the right, the left caring about you know the, um, the, the fact that you know fair wages are not being paid uh, to these workers elsewhere, uh, that their environmental standards are weak and from the right where it's mostly about you know our, our, our uh, production versus other people's production, there's been much more of a, uh, a, a resume, resumption of a, a conversation about trade. And so what 
in some ways what we'll try to do today is to try to connect a bit the kind of the more bland economics discourse to this much more political discourse. And there's a reason <laughs> that's urgent and that this slide does a good job of saying that trade is where uh, economists and others disagree perhaps the most. So this is, this is the same, uh, you've seen this, um, this panel of experts before. The experts were asked uh, imposing new US tariffs on steel and aluminum will improve um, Americans' well-being, yes, no. And 100% of the experts said yes. A third of the of the of our sample of kind of uh, regular Americans uh, said yes. So there is a sharp and clear disagreement there, and um, that's part of the. Uh, and if you, I am. This is a guess, but I think among those people who disagree, there's a very large proportion of people who voted for Trump and who in general hold economists in contempt. Mm. That shift kind of away from the economist view and towards a more, maybe a more um, anti-trade view is very much reflected in the political conversations. Uh, if you can, you can read uh, in the, those of you know U.S. history, um, George Bush Sr. Uh, and uh, Bill Clinton were presidents of the U.S. respectively in 88 and then Clinton went from 88 to 92 was Bush, 92 to 2000 was Clinton. They were both, um, uh, you know, this was a period where the North American Free Trade Agreement was negotiated. That's a free trade agreement between Mexico, Canada, and the US. It was sold to the American public as just being an obvious good thing. It will foster more equality, more preservation of the environment, and a greater possibility of world peace, uh, more American jobs, everything good. Uh, this was um, now. We now cut to 2016 and you see that the rhetoric has changed very significantly. Um, uh, and you see Trump saying, I visited laid off for factory workers and the community is crushed by our horrible and unfair trade deals. These are the forget forgotten men and women of our country and they are forgotten but they are not going to be forgotten for long. I can't do the Trump accent. Mm. Uh, these are people who work hard but no longer have a voice. I am your voice. Um, and to, to be fair, he was. I mean, he certainly spent a lot of political energy talking about uh, the unfairness of trade. Though in Trump's case, he, he's, he has a certain love for being able to blame people. So, the, you know, if it wasn't trade, he would have found something else to blame probably for. Um, but Biden, who's not like Trump at all, does say something very uh, similar. He says, you know, we, are, we, we, can, we can compete on the global stage, but only if the rules of trade are not stacked against us. Um, we, we have to protect the workers and the uh, intellectual property. Those are code words for saying, let's not have too much free, free trade. The, the, the protecting workers has always been one of the, as I said, the left's, uh, left's code word for not having trade has always been that. And Biden is very much invoking that. So you, you start to see that, in, I mean, this is not, um, this is not accidental. There is a sense of disquiet with trade, and I think that's that's a good context for uh, this lecture. Now, let's maybe start um, go back many years. Um, in fact, we're going going to go back a couple of hundred years. Um, it's in the eighteen early eighteen hundreds that David Ricardo, who is uh, 
was a, a stockbroker uh, in London who made a um, bunch of money. Then, in, as was then the practice, he bought himself a seat in the parliament, in effect. Uh, he became a member of parliament and in his spare time, while stockbroking, making lots of money and being in a member of the parliament, he uh, also managed to write some of the seminal texts of early economics. So, this is a remarkable man uh, by any standards, you know, sort of doing uh, everything um, all at once. And he, he was the, I think, the first really clear, clear expositor of the logic of, of, of what has become the standard idea of trade theory. So, he actually starts, this is the idea of comparative advantage is very much Ricardo's idea. Rick, David Ricardo ke, 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 comes up with this idea at the beginning of the 19th century. And his point is, uh, you know, yes, yeah, sure, some, some things you are really just good at. You know, um, grapes don't grow in Scotland and maybe, I don't know, the French can't brew whiskey. I, don't, I, I think that seems less plausible, but maybe, I, I think they can probably. But even if France was better at everything or China is better at everything, it can't possibly be true that China produces everything in the world. Why? Because if China produces everything in the world, Ricardo pointed out, there wouldn't be anyone to buy it. If China didn't want to, uh, if China didn't want to import something, why would they, they sell something to the U.S.? Because they would be the money they would get from selling it to the U.S. would be worthless. So it, they have to be. It has to be that the market drives it to the point where China produces some things and the U.S. produces some other things and whatever, France produces some yet other things and th that, that would be true even if China was better at producing, you know, excellent, uh, you know, burgundy wines, um, which they may well be eventually. But in any case, the, if they were, if they could do it, they still wouldn't want to do it because they would need France to produce something to be able to sell to France. This is uh, the, so, so his point was therefore, Ricardo's point was that therefore, don't worry about not having, you know, being not as good as the Chinese, they, you, the market will find what you are b better at and it's going to be, you don't have to be absolutely better, you just have to be relatively better. In other words, if France and, if France can produce both grapes and whiskey, but France is relatively better at grapes than at whiskey, then Scotland will take whiskey. And that's, that's, that was, in fact, um, uh, I think the example Ricardo gave was Portugal might be better than England in both producing wool and uh, wine, uh, but it was relatively better at uh, wine, so England will have to produce wool. Um, and when you do that, when you specialize, when you produce what you're really the best at, your GDP should go up because you are now not using the same resources to produce both uh, wool and uh, uh, wine. You, you're good at wine, you produce wine, and the other country uh, will produce the, produce the uh, wool and you'll trade. And that way, neither, both of you will be producing the good you're best at, which is going to make you know, life better for everybody. This, was, this is the idea that there must be gains from trade. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's sort of the history of, uh, of uh, trade theory. But that idea, that logic is impeccable. Even if it's 200 years old, it was always the idea that, you know, you will, the market will typically drive you towards choosing what you're relatively better at is, is very much uh, something that, uh, you know, has, has had a very, 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 long uh, shelf life and remains one of the uh, most solid ideas in trade thinking.
uh, maybe I stop here to, uh, to see if there's any. Okay. I'll continue. Um, questions are welcome. So this is perhaps the next after Ricardo, I would say this is was the next, I think, really um, central insight in trade theory. And it took a long time. This is from the 19, I'm going to say in the 1930s. Uh, so uh, 100 years of, you know, there were lots of people uh, writing about it. But the, I think the, the next deep insight comes from uh, work by our erstwhile colleague, uh, Paul Samuelson. Paul Samuelson um, was a professor at MIT. Um, he died, I'm going to say, 15 years ago. But before that, he would come to lunch every week, uh, even though he was then approaching 100, and carry and hold on, uh, hold a, a conversation where he was the dominant speaker, at almost till the day he died. He was a very impressive man. Um, so one of the things that he, they say is that now, now let's think about trade where, um, you know, the other side of trade, who produces the goods that, uh, or how do the goods that are traded produced? So we sort of start by thinking of, you know, grapes and, uh, and whiskey and maybe those things just grow wild and you just trade. But, uh, you know, most things are produced. And, you know, you need labor and capital. Uh, and I think is not, uh, I mean, there's no uh, surprise. You would think that rich countries tend to have a relatively more capital. That's what sort of makes them rich countries. And poor countries have relatively more labor relative to capital. So if that's the case, then you would start to ask, okay, uh, which of these countries, if you had traded, if these two, two countries started trading with each other, and some goods were more labor intensive than others. They were more goods that were produced mostly with labor versus goods that are produced mostly with capital. If you, if you had that kind, of, and that's plausible, certainly we know that, you know, uh, embroidery is done by hand and uh, you know whatever steel is made in big factories so you know uh, you could imagine uh, lots of variation in in the labor intensity of goods so take 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 the most uh, labor intensive goods well where would you what would trade do trade will push the country that has more labor relative to capital to produce those labor intensive goods uh, that's the same logic in a sense of Ricardo's logic, which is that you know, you'll be relatively better at things which where you have an abundant in, input and you, if you have abundant labor, you'll produce, uh, you'll produce uh, carpets and mm, probably less steel. What that means is that when you open to trade, the poor country will use more and more of its labor. Poor country is where the labor will be because it's going to start producing more labor intensive goods. It's going to move out of producing steel and start producing carpets. That's going to increase the demand for labor and increase uh, wages in the poor country. In the rich country, the reverse would happen. Rich country will stop using its labor as much. The labor will be, uh, you know, not as as uh, as uh, useful for. Um, producing steel and therefore wages would fall relative to the return on capital. Both countries will be better off, but the gains from trade will be differently divided in the two countries. In the poor country, the gains will, from trade will go to the poor, yeah, a lot of it. And in the rich country, they will, more of it will go to the rich. What that says is that while there are of gains for trade in both countries, they need to be redistributed, at least in the rich country. Because there'll be the workers are just by the nature of the theory, it says the workers in the rich country will be left worse off, and therefore we will need to take actions to make it make them whole. That's that's the idea. That's one of the core ideas of trade, which is that gains are countries gain 
but only if the gains are appropriately redistributed. But then that last phrase is often forgotten in the political conversation. We sort of, when economists go and say there are gains from trade, they don't say the caveat that when they are redistributed. And that, that might be a place where things, things get uh, more tricky and we'll come back to that point. Maybe I again stop is, if they have been talking a lot. Yes, there is a question on what can you say about trade as a way to export externalities like pollution? Uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, there is trade in, uh, in um, all kinds of, for example, um, countries do sell their radioactive waste and all kinds of other things that uh, is, is uh, you know, and I think there is clearly a little bit preying on desperation. Some countries are, so ship breaking is a, uh, is a profession which is, it turns out to be extremely polluting and it's done in India and Bangladesh and that's probably not an accident. It's probably the case that these are kinds of things that, you know, uh, where uh, the regulations are weak and the workers are willing to because to take more risk because they have no uh, no other form of living that's where often the these things happen so I, I'm, I'm not amazed by the fact that this is happening uh, this seems to me to be nonetheless something that people are more aware of and you know there is I think in terms of the global trade in bads I think that that's something that I suspect uh, you know should be thought of as being one particular peculiarity which has a lot to do with the enforcement of regulations in s poor countries. And I think we certainly want in, in those, those ways, if not all, in other ways, we certainly want uniform regulations so that there is no incentive to, to put your radioactivity in the, in the blood of the uh, people in some poor country. But I, I, I mean, I, I think that's at the level of abstraction we're talking about, that seems to be a relatively easy uh, uh, place to intervene to, to fix things. Uh, I mean, then there's one question coming back to the political situation in the US that you mentioned in the beginning. The person is asking whether the way how trade is currently done without adequate redistribution is part of what is driving inequality in the US. Absolutely, but that's, that's a point I will spend time on. So let me, let me, let me not, uh, I, I, I entirely agree, but I, do, I think that I won't really elaborate right now because I will have slides and, and evidence and all that on that. Let me, let me, I'll come back to that. And, and then one question that's probably also related to this, but so the person is asking if for rich countries, it is realistic to move all the factories back to home just to respond to the voice of the labor class probably for no country. It probably makes no sense in any uh, world to move, you know, all the factories. I mean, there are very good reasons why countries don't produce cer certain goods and the economies of scale are enormous in many, many things. And, you know, you want to have them centralized. The economies of scale are enormous. The economies of um, of just learning and enormous the you know the places which are very good at producing certain things I, I, will, I, I think the idea that you know every uh, county should produce computer chips is is uh, ludicrous in my view so I, I think that we, 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 we should t absolutely start from the idea that trade is wonderful then uh, we get because I think we are not all good at producing everything, even if you think within country trade is a huge part of trade, by the way, a huge, I mean, dominant part of trade in a country like the US is within country trade. And within country trade is, has many of the same effects, which is that, you know, some places get impoverished uh, because other places are better at doing certain things. The factories in the US moved to the south uh, after uh, in the 1950s and 60s, leaving places like Boston, where we live, as desolate, deindustrialized landscapes. Exactly the story we tell about across countries happened within the US. 
so it's you know you I think there is is the, the effects of the, the negative effects of trade are are present within within countries. So it's not a matter of just bringing the factories home. It's a, then you have to think of where to locate everything and whether you want to literally say that Boston should never change and have its, you know, the uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where MIT is, was famous for its horse stirrups factory. They used to produce stirrups for horses. Um, it's not probably that, that useful anymore to keep that factory. So I, I, I do think that change is inevitable and trade is valuable and the US is um, every, every county in the US benefits from trading with other counties and if you know Facebook ha had to be reproduced in every county it would be probably no Facebook which may be a good thing but that's a separate story. I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, the samuelson stolper theorem as we, uh, we were talking about the result that in poor countries, uh, poor people benefit from trade. Is there evidence for it? This is a, it's a, it's been a, lots of people, it's a, it's a central proposition. Everybody knows about it. Everybody's been looking for evidence for a long time. People try to look at what happens in a country when it liberalizes. So in India, India liberalizes in, in 1991 and India before that was an extraordinarily closed economy, meaning essentially there were car imports were not allowed and as a result these cute little white cars which were uh, more or less carbon copy of a 1956 Morris Oxford. Now you don't know what a Morris Oxford is because Morris was a British company which like all other British car companies also or almost all of them died a natural death in some, many years ago. This was the, their one imprint in history, this, this car, the ambassador, it was, it was retained in India and you can still see them today. Uh, they are less and less common but you can still see, see them, they stopped produce, being produced I think probably 10-15 years ago. So this was very, a very closed economy um, and in 1991 India liberalized mostly because India had no choice. It was too, it was extremely indebted and could not pay its debts and therefore in its foreign currency uh, obligations and therefore it had to, had to liberalize. Uh, that was part of a deal with the IMF. Um, and I should say two things there. One is that um, when it happened, there was plenty of people saying this is going to be a complete disaster. India is not competitive. India has not had been closed from trade for so long. Uh, a very large and very quick opening of the economy will mean just it will be wiped out. Um, but think of Ricardo's logic. If, it, if it's wiped out, Indians won't be buy anything either. So you know the, all the expo, you know you can't buy. Uh, buy goods from abroad unless you sell things abroad and that logic in fact operated. So India's GDP actually goes down for one year and then it starts growing exactly following the trend. If you look at that graph, it follows the trend that it was following before. Uh, there's no acceleration in 1992. Uh, you know, the, the, it's not that growth goes up. But it doesn't go down either. Basically, it continues. So, first, strike against this view that you know trade opening is going to generate lots of benefits. Uh, but then, in the longer run, India uh, and China uh, and many other economies have you know, clearly benefited massively from being able to trade. So, I, I think that uh, India starts growing faster and faster, but not immediately. So that, that, that was not particularly um, uh, compelling one way or the other um, and there's a very good reason why it's not compelling. It's not, you can, it's not just that you, India is particularly weird, it's that when liberalization happens many other things change. Uh, you know, the, uh, the inter, there was an internal liberalization. As I was saying, lots of trade within 
the country is restricted in for a variety of reasons and those restrictions have uh, their own uh, own costs and so those were also removed at the same time a lot of the goods were restricted for production by this category of firm or that category of firms those were removed uh, over time so lots of things kept changing and so uh, part of it is that you know there's no reason to think that the liberalization is this one unique thing that happens at a point of time with everything else held fixed and nothing else was held fixed there were all kinds of political changes partly as a result of the liberalization so the this process where just where was going on so it's very hard to separate the things that were happening with it the, from the liberalization itself a second thing that uh, makes it also um, i mean you know, india uh, then there's a question of you know what was happening in india uh, so those who think that liberalization actually did create trade opening did create growth in india say you know i know a lot about india uh, i know that india was just going to collapse it was growing as I, the graph shows it was growing before the liberalization is growing after the liberalization but you know i happen to know that if they had not liberalized in 1991 disaster would have happened so there is a whole set of so but then you could argue the reverse that india was doing perfectly fine and uh, if they had not liberalized nothing bad would have happened the same thing would have just continue so i i think that that's not resolvable and then there's a whole question of uh, which is related to what i was saying about many things changing is what is exactly trade liberalization is how much liberalization is liberalization and so on and you know after all india didn't remove all tariffs it just removed all the very high tariffs so is that is that liberalization that's not so you you can have philosophical debates endlessly and in the end we don't get anywhere now one thing you can also ask similarly and with the similar similar challenges is the other side of the the uh, the samuelson stolper theorem there would be gains from trade if there's trade between countries of with different uh, you know factor endowments with you know if labor abundant countries trade with capital abundant countries they'll both gain that's point number 1 point number 2 is that in the labor abundant country inequality should go down when there's trade so that's something that again people have looked at it's and again the pr same problems that i mentioned with looking at what happens to growth uh, remain you you're comparing uh, one country before and after and many things are changing uh, i leave that uh, you know so but with that one thing that's very striking and this picture is from mexico but to be honest you could find the same picture for uh, india argentina colombia china you see the same very same pattern which is that after liberalization inequality balloons that's a pattern that seems to be very unlike the growth one where i, I is really not possible to say anything happened i think the correlation here is rather Uh, systematic which is uh, when countries open inequality goes up and the, the now that still doesn't i mean it when the country opens many things change the you know the the country also start saying oh we should have lower taxes because you know we need whatever uh, to reward business people all kinds of things change so i i, I wouldn't again blame liberalization for it necessarily but it's it's uh, the correlation here is more clear cut than it's in the case of growth i'll take a break there um, yes so there is a question coming back to the theory of ricardo that you explained in the beginning so somebody is asking how do people identify their comparative advantage how do countries identify their comparative advantage for example in countries like india with a great diversity of resources labor geography geography etc and then some people were puzzled because they say that poor countries labor is mostly illiterate and they have low skills so what can they be compared their com what can be their comparative advantage okay so let me start with the second one the whole point is exactly that which is that uh, comparative advantage is something that is uh, comparative so even though most of the labor is you know maybe not very well educated i think illiterate is a little bit 
uh, unfair. I think most of them are literate, but uh, nonetheless, I think they, you know, they are they are um, probably less educated than French labor, but. Uh, that just means that there are things that people you don't need uh, you know 12 years and a back to to do there's a you know you're making carpets carpets can be made even by I mean, lots of carpets are made in, in, in India by women who have two or three years of edu education so it's they have a, they, they not having an education doesn't mean they don't have a skill they learn skill how to use their hands beautifully they make some of the world's most beautiful carpets these these very poorly educated women so it's a, it's a matter of now that gets me to the first question which is you know what's what ricardo is saying is not that india goes and sets up the commission to find comparative advantage he's saying markets will find it because the prices will of, of of the goods will change in ways to, to drive those signals. The goods that are profitable will be produced and the goods that are profitable will be the goods where the country has comparative advantage, where the resources are best used. That's, the, that's what's beautiful about trade theory is that it is not a statement about, uh, you know, the commission for identifying uh, comparative advantage. It's a theory about the fact that the market's inner logic drives us to pick what we are relatively good at doing. So that's, that's, that's uh, I think that's the, I think that's useful clarification that I should have probably made, but I, I think it's. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, as, a, as a, uh, I already emphasized, you know, all of these cases, you worry that, you know, 10 other things were changing. So how can we really say what's happening? So, uh, you know, the tax laws are changing. The, you know, the industrial permit regime was changing. Everything was changing at the same time. So how do we know what, what was causal? Um, so one, uh, one uh, idea that you might have is that let's compare within a country. Well, we can look at whether when, uh, you know, there's trade liberalization, do, do, is it the case that uh, places which are, mm, you know, benefit more from uh, one, you know, let's say, for which, are, which produce more capital goods, uh, do, does the, uh, and places where within the country which produce more labor intensive goods to the places that produce more labor intensive goods gain when trade opens up. So, you know, there's more trade. Now, the problem with that statement is that that's actually, and this is a point that we'll come, we'll come back to uh, when we talk about growth, uh, is that that starts from the assumption that this, there's one labor and one capital in the country. That is because it's some sense trade, the whole theory we were discussing was about countries and countries are supposed to have labor and labor and given that the countries have labor and countries are open, you would, the logic of the model says there should be one wage. If the wage is higher, people should migrate to that place. This is uh, obviously something that doesn't happen uh, as much as we, uh, imagine uh, that was uh, the last lecture that Esther gave was that you know people don't actually migrate nearly as much as you might imagine uh, but the concept the con uh, concept that the whole theory is based on is is that you know migration equalizes wages so why wages, wages are always uh, there's only one wage for low skilled labor in the country in which case you can't really test that theory you can't you can't ask, um, if, you, if you believe the theory, you, in a sense you can't test it, that's the paradox. It's that you, if you believe the theory, which say, is based on the premise that you know, resources are used efficiently. So you know, if labor is needed in, in uh, Paris and there's lots of uh, people not working in 
I know, in Lyon, then people from Lyon will move to Paris and they will work in Paris and therefore uh, the wage will be the same in Lyon and Paris. People will keep living in Lyon till the wages in Lyon rise till the level of Paris. So at some level, if you start with this idea that resources are efficiently used, then that goes with the idea that there should be one wage because the wage is, is about you know, getting people to work and so if people, if one place needs labor, it's going to raise the wage till the way it gets the labor. So there should be a one wage in the country. Uh, is the fact that there's one wage in the country is not an accidental, uh, so incidental assumption. It is a core assumption that goes with the idea that countries uh, assign resources efficiently. But once you assume that countries assign resources efficiently, then you start to worry about, you know, uh, once you assume that, this, then there is no variation in the wage. So you can't say that you know this place had labor intensive manufacture and that one had capital intensive manufacture. So the trade effect should be different in those two places because the wages will be the same in both places. There wouldn't be inequality, more inequality in one place than the other. That's sort of a paradox of assuming that trade works, the, the whole model of trade kind of functions has the implication that you can't test the theory. So that's, that's uh, where, uh, the, where we were till a Petya Tobolova, who was a student at MIT, decided that she just could ignore that implication. She's just going to say, okay, I don't believe it. I don't believe that wages are equalized across all those places. If you stop saying that, but then of course you don't necessarily believe in the, the theory either. Uh, that's the problem, but let's just be empirical. Let's just think about what happens. So then you could actually, if you if you're willing to assume that wages are not uh, are not um, equalized across places, then you can start to test the theory. You can start to ask India liberalized. Uh, when India liberalized, what it did was actually r rather good for. I mean, may not have been good for anything else, but it was good for research because. It, there were different goods that India produced. Some had very high tariffs, 90 percent. Others had 30 percent. And basically what India did was it brought down all tariffs to the roughly the same level, close to 30 percent. So, so that means that some places the tariffs were cut by as much as 60 percent. Other places tariffs were not cut at all. Uh, that is, to, I'm, I should be more precise. Some goods tariffs were cut by 60 percent, some goods tariffs were cut by or not at all. But there were places that had specialized in the production of the first kind of good and places that were specialized in the production of the second kind of good. So now you can classify places by how much the tariff went down in that place rather than somewhere else because that you know some places produce wood produce where maybe the tariff went down a lot and some produce uh, produced cotton produce and where the tariff didn't go down a lot so you could say that the cotton produce cotton manufacturing areas were going to be um, you know less affected by a tariff change than the wood manufacturing areas so that's that's a kind of so that that was the idea of her of her research exercise so she's basically asking um, can we can we use the fact that some places were much more affected by the by the tariff change than others to now look at w whether the places where the tariff goes down by more are places where as the theory would say uh, if, where the tariff goes down by more uh, poverty should go down by more as well because remember India is a poor country, labor abundant. So where the tariff goes down by more, those places are the ones who benefit most from trade. They specialize more, uh, they move towards goods that are, they are good at producing and poverty should go down. So poverty should go down exactly where tariffs go down a lot. So that's, that's her, her idea. Um, and basically the places where uh, that happened, a lot of that was driven by the fact that they happened to have goods that whose tariff happened to be high. Um, um, 
all, all places ended up with the same or uh, similar final tariff. So in some ways that's, that's, that means that you could think of this as being almost like a, you know, you were just unlucky. Uh, you were producing goods that were not, um, which, you know, where you had, um, you know, you, you, you were already, uh, you, you, you didn't get a lot of protection before and therefore nothing much, you, in a sense you, you didn't get a big change now, other places got a big change because they started from having producing other goods. So that's sort of like a, a quasi experiment and what she finds is what trade economists really hated, which is the opposite of what everybody, we've been always told uh, that when tariffs will go down, the poor in poor countries were will benefit and what this table shows and you, uh, uh, you can look at it at your leisure uh, is that the fall in tariff is uh, negatively related in the, with uh, poverty. So poverty actually falls uh, less in areas where the tariff falls by more. So more opening actually hurts the poor, it does not help the poor. So that's, that, that was her conclusion. It was much resisted um, uh, I'll, I'll sk so I will I'll, I'll, uh, sort of come to questions after this one. So uh, this was a paper that in a sense uh, you know broke some taboos and opened up an entire literature. So there, were, they sort of was, there was this taboo of, you know, why would you think that within country you can, you can assume there's variation in wages. So it showed basically that there was variation in wages, that wages didn't converge within the country. That's point number one. It's sort of maybe the most important contribution was just to point out that in fact you can compare regions within the same country and uh, learn something about changes in policy. Uh, because in fact wages do not converge, converge wages remain variable. The second thing it did was it of course it sort of flew in the face of what people believed and was therefore people were very annoyed with the paper I must uh, say. We, we, we provide a, a little more graphic description of that process in, in the book but it, it was trade economists and of a particular generation were rather annoyed with this paper. It seemed to say have the wrong answer and a lot of people's uh, uh, reaction was since it has a wrong answer it must be wrong. But uh, that, that turned out not to be uh, the final reaction. And it, therefore once you open up this Pandora's box you can now do the same thing for other countries. Trade liberalizations happen in many countries. You can compare regions exactly like she does and eventually we'll talk about a paper where does this for the US and finds actually the same kind of surprising result. I will, uh, let me um, take a uh, pause and uh, answer some questions. Yes, so there is one more question on yeah. the identification of the comparative advantage yeah. and the person is asking if markets do provide signals on what the comparative adv advantage should be, why do politicians often misinterpret it? And the person is citing the example of India where the person is saying the capital intensive sector receives much more attention than the, the labor sector. And then there is a question more generally on given that the comparative advantage should be there for mutual benefit. How should we react to the situation that a significant portion of the profit that accrues, uh, the profit from trade accrues to foreign corporations or governments? And yeah, you can go ahead first. So on the first question, that's a that's an interesting and maybe more. Uh, I might have something to say about that later, which is uh, the first question is asking: Is it? Uh, does it make sense for governments to, for example, favor capital intensive industries? And that is that's never been quite resolved. But there the question is, is not whether or not um, we should be looking for comparative advantage, but whether or not sometimes we should deviate a little bit from comparative advantage in certain directions. And certainly there is a case that is made by 
um, based often on giving the example of Korea that you know certain specific types of ex investments especially in high skilled manufacturing has spillovers and uh, the question of spillovers I'll come back to the question of spillovers briefly uh, when we talk about growth. So l let's wait on that one but that's that's very much that question. Maybe there is some reason maybe there isn't and I, I don't think the evidence is uh, watertight but of slightly you know big big plants might have some spillovers which uh, you, you don't get otherwise and so that, that question is an interesting one and we'll hold it for now and we'll, we'll, we'll come, come back to that. Uh, on the, on the uh, so remind me what the second. The I mean, I think that there is no guarantee. That's an excellent point. I should have said it. There is gains from trade. Both countries will gain, but there is no guarantee that the gains from trade are equally distributed at all. I mean, and there is no. In some ways, I think the presumption is that therefore, but that's all the more reason why you might think that poor countries, this Samuelson Stolper result was important because in many ways it's saying that look even if capital move, uh, you know comes from a different country to take advantage of trade from you, you, you know if you know US capital moves to India and runs plants there, workers should benefit. You know, uh, you know, maybe U.S. capitalists will also benefit, but at least workers in India should benefit because labor-intensive that will increase the demand for labor, and that's going to be. So I think that was that's why this result I'm saying that the workers, the poor, don't benefit very much from trade is particularly worrying because it, it sort of raises that issue that you know it's, there's no guarantee that even you know if foreign capital comes maybe it benefits some rich people but not poor people and that, that's, that's why I think that, that result is important. Okay, let me, so I think what, what Petya Topalova's result showed as, as I was saying is that it's not a guarantee that you know labor is, um, labor is uh, sort of very um, there's no guarantee that wages are equalized across the country where labor doesn't always move where the wages are high. That's the same point that in a sense you heard in, in when we were talking about migration. And that, but that means that uh, you know, we, we need to worry about uh, diff a different class of uh, in a sense distributional implications. It's within country uh, some groups might benefit and others, others may not. And more generally, we, we, we can't take as given the fact that within a country, resources move to their best use. That's sort of the presumption of trade theory was that, as I was saying, that you know, re, all the logic comes from the, this is the efficient way to use resources. Markets will drive resources to its, their efficient uses. And therefore, we can, we can just uh, treat, um, you know, the country as being one object. All the, it's just, it has resources, it, it's used, used best, this is what it should produce. In fact, within the country, resources are, don't move to the best uses, and therefore, uh, the country is not just one homogeneous entity. It's, you know, the resources may be, there might be too much labor that stays in one place and too few labor, uh, but labor is, there's a demand for labor somewhere else and the laborers don't move there. So you have to think about the sticky economy. People, us. And I think one of the things that, uh, this is a, a simple graphic which shows that um, the, you know, if these are measures of labor mobility and one of the things this, this shows is that if you look at the year 1991 in this graphic, uh, nothing changes. There's no change in labor mobility. It's not the case that if the country specializes for trade, you, one thing you would imagine is that uh, the places which are, mm, you know, some places will benefit from trade because they'll be producing the goods that the country should be producing. Other places will lose from trade because they should, they're producing the goods that the country um, will not no longer produce, will import. As a result, you would think that the uh, workers will move from the places which are more exposed to, uh, you know, which benefit from trade to the places which 
lose from trade. You do not see any change in labor mobility in 1991. In a sense, right after 91, you see a fall, if anything. Um, and uh, this, this is from the Petia Topolova paper, uh, again asking where the tariffs fell. Is it the case that, uh, you know, if the tariffs fell by more and therefore we see uh, people, we saw that in those places poverty fell by less. Is it the case that people exited those areas? And again, there's no correlation at all between, between how many people, uh, we can't, she can't look at exit. The data only tells us in migration, but in migration into those areas, which should be less because those are areas which lost, uh, you know, which lost, um, they, they were favored by tariffs and now they, their tariffs were cut. So they were the places where, you know, the existing businesses were hurt more. So you would think people would be less likely to in-migrate into those areas, and, but she finds no evidence of that. So again, that's consistent with the view that people really didn't move as a result of these changes. They stayed where they stayed, and that sort of, again, evokes the migration thinking. Um, and, you know, consistent with that, uh, the, she, she looks at whether or not some, the, the labor laws and how easy it is to fire laborers varies within India. Some states are much more protective of laborers than others, just as like, you know, France is more protective of laborers than the US or something. And what she finds is that in particular, the, uh, the poverty uh, fall, uh, where the poverty particularly doesn't fall are places where labor it's very hard for laborers to uh, to be fired and that's that that so the labor laws actually make it hard to reallocate labor as uh, it's just hard to fire labor that's where you get the particularly bad effects of trade so in this it's telling a story very much about the stickiness or uh, how the stickiness of the economy then plays into the effects of trade. It's exactly this idea that, you know, um, we, were, we were supposed to reallocate labor, we, we, you know, we should shut down our factory, go out and or move to a different, you know, we were producing steel, we should produce plastics, we, the people who were good at plastics, uh, we, we should hire the people who are good at steel, we will have to let go. Uh, if that's hard to do, then you get obviously the effects of trade tend to be more negative if you can't do that. And that, that seems to be the kind of part of the story. Um, I, this is a, maybe this is a good place for me to stop. Uh, I will resume telling this story, but uh, to just to uh, place uh, one last thought uh, in, in your minds. Um, uh, the, the line of thinking we are going to go to is thinking about regions and what happens if labor and capital don't move very much, but trade nevertheless uh, is, you know, you're still nevertheless opened up to trade and you, then you look at, look at what it does and it's going to do all kinds of things that are much more consistent with people's intuition about trade. That, you know, this idea that trade actually in the US people argue that trade hurts and the fact that it hurts a lot is partly, I think, driven by the fact that mobility is, is low and that's mobility of labor. Capital in the U.S. tends to be quite mobile. Uh, as a result, you get often consequences which are, in a sense, consistent with this, you know, anti-trade view that uh, a lot of people in the U.S. are now taking. So I'll stop there and I'll resume uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, hello again. I want to resume from where I was at the end of the last lecture, where we were talking about the encounter between the beautiful theory of trade and the more grimy reality that it goes with. Um, in particular, we were talking about the, uh, the famous samuelson stolpe theorem, which tells us, assures us that uh, in poor countries at least, opening to trade is going to be good news for the poor. Uh, interestingly, we now have data from many countries that have opened up 
And I think the systematic pattern is the opposite, that the inequality balloons when countries open. Now that may well be because of, uh, of other factors. Uh, this, is not, this is not to say that it is necessarily causal, but it's certainly cause for concern. And we were kind of drifting into an, a second conversation, which is that one reason why the theory doesn't seem to apply is that resources are not mobile between sectors that uh, you know, lose because of trade and sectors that gain. And we just don't see the kind of resource mobility that we might have expected. We discussed the fact that that might be because the labor market is, um, that labor market is sticky, uh, that people, you know, don't want to move. But it also, I mean, even if the labor market is sticky, uh, you, if capital is mobile, uh, a lot of the problems could be solved by capital moving. So it needs to be because after all it's capital and labor need, that need to be in the same place and so if labor doesn't move capital will. And that was the faith many people had but we increasingly also see that um, capital isn't very mobile. So this table is from some work we did many 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 years ago looking at uh, uh, the details kind of internal data of an Indian bank. And it was, it was very clear, what was striking about this data is the absence of, of you know, the, the, the dog that didn't bark. So you, you, you know, our usual view is that profitable companies, companies that are growing, companies that are uh, projecting future growth, these are the companies that are going to attract capital. And in reverse, the capital will not go to companies which are not growing, which are not making money, etc. And that's a wait for the market to sort of send capital to where it belongs, where, where it has the best use. What this table shows uh, is that if you look at the kind of companies that grew um, and the companies that didn't grow or the ones that had, were profitable and the ones with, that were not, the granted limit is not raised any more than either of them. What's a granted limit? The granted limit is banks typically give you a kind of a, a, a credit line. They say that, look, you know, you can borrow as much as you want whenever you need it up to a limit of X, you know, 100 million rupees. And if, if that limit is not raised, then uh, you, your borrowing from year to year will stay the same. If it's raised, then you can get uh, more in the, in the second year uh, than in the first. And the key point that this data is suggesting is that while some companies get raises and others don't, it seems uncorrelated with their performance. If you, you're, you're, you're growing, your needs are growing, you're, pro you're profitable, those are the signals that you would look for to send capital. And what this table suggests is that that's not what's happening. You know, some companies are growing, some are not, but it's not obviously the, uh, the companies that look like they're making money or growing. So that's, that's a, another flag if you like, of the fact that, you know, instead of sort of capital rushing to where the trade creates new opportunities, capital is sluggish. And that's, that might well be the reason why we don't get the kind of benefits of trade. That, um, indeed, uh, there is even evidence that firms don't shift very much in response to trade. So you might say that, you know, even if I have the fixed amount of capital and labor, I can change my product mix. I can produce the things that I'm best at producing and dump the products that are not particularly, uh, particularly uh, attractive. Now, one of the f facts that people have documented is that at least in India, uh, trade liberalization doesn't increase the number of products that you produce. You the number of products that you exit from uh, is unaffected by trade liberalization uh, and the number of products you join. This is the same variation we discussed. The, you know, some, uh, some geographical areas happen to have products which are more uh, you know, trade, uh, tr affected by trade. Those areas didn't, the firms in those areas didn't drop more products than other firms. This uh, picture is uh, two products that are still available in parts of India despite 
uh, you know, these were products, very much distinctive products of uh, the closed economy India that I remember from when I was young. And in that, in the, in that India, there was this orange drink called Gold Spot and these kind of awful bubble gum called bubble gum. And those products you might imagine have, um, you know, some, uh, you know, there would be some uh, point where, you know, there's a whole diversity of such things in the world and that they might go out of business. But all of these products have, in a sense, continued through this process of massive change in the, you know, volume of trade. So it's, it seems, it's a very much the same story, which is sluggish movement seems to be, to be a, kind of ongoing feature of the of the uh, uh, you know the Indian economy when exposed to trade and that's that might well explain why the experience is somewhat at odds with the theory so I think that that's a sort of a, a first round answer to the question why is trade why is trade uh, less maybe positive in its impact on the poor and poor countries. What, what I want to do, uh, so that, and maybe to summarize the point I'm going to come back to, which is that, that the, the, a more broader implication of that, an implication that will be important in, when we think about growth, is that countries are not single labor markets, nor are they single capital markets, they are, nor are they single anything markets. They're really very fragmented pieces of, of, uh, of uh, the country uh, operate as separate uh, segments. Um, they seem to have uh, the, you know, this kind of st stickiness that we've been describing. They, they you know, think resources don't go from where they should be to where they uh, from to where they should be, to from where they should not be, and that that stickiness is critical in understanding uh, both just the trade response, but also the growth response, because growth is also about reallocating resources to opportunities. To uh, the word creative destruction showed up in the previous slide. I'll come back to that one, but it's it's about change, about things, good things growing and less good things shrinking. Those changes don't seem to happen very much. That's a, uh, that doesn't have to mean, and I should say this very uh, emphatically, that trade doesn't do a lot of good. I mean, it's clear that the countries that did grow did, uh, you know, did do a, a lot of its, uh, their work through trade. There were a lot of trade was important in that. But it doesn't seem to go through the mechanisms we imagine, the mechanisms of massive reallocation and quick reallocation of resources necessarily. It, it can, but it doesn't have to. And you know, we see massive reallocation of resources, for example, in China, the labor force moves out of agriculture and moves into, into, into traded, traded sectors. So it's not that it can't happen, but it doesn't seem to be a necessary component. And that means that some of the predictions we expect may, may, may not uh, may not pan out, it, and this obviously has implications for how we think about growth and more generally about the performance of, of economics. So let me, let me uh, stop there and, and see if, if there are any questions. Uh, none yet, so I will continue. Um, we'll get a chance again soon. So part of, but I want to take this question a bit further. I mean, part of the, I think, the response to trade, the, you know, the, maybe the muted response to trade is because there is just not enough, um, you know, uh, internal uh, mobility of resources. But there's an additional problem, which I think is increasingly becoming visible in the trade literature. The people in trade are becoming more aware of it. It's something that I think is intuitive, but in some ways uh, not, is more recent in trade thinking. So this, this, this uh, was a, a sort of, you know, the presumption of a lot of uh, uh, well, trade-based thinking about growth is that, well, you know, yes, China is dominant today, but 
do China's dominance raises China's wages. And when it raises China's wages and its land values, then lots of things will be unaffordable in China. You just won't be able to pay for them because you know labor is too expensive. So take a very labor intensive product, carpets. Carpets should be moving to another country, a country with more, uh, more labor and uh, you know, less, less capital. So a country like Egypt. So Egypt uh, makes a lot of carpets, traditionally has made a lot of carpets, but there was very little exports of carpets. And the question is, can we, can that, is that somehow just inevitable or is there something we can do about it? And the reason why that question is important is that if we can't do something about it, then it means that maybe, uh, you know, just the pro productivity is not there. But if we can, then we might actually be able to uh, use the, uh, use the availability of those uh, resources to uh, to uh, to the, the, to uh, produce more products and it's just something that we could eventually fix there was a there is a, an organization called aid to artisans which took on the responsibility of exploring this can we get egypt to become a major exporter in carpets and it, it, it worked with another uh, carpet uh, seller, uh, Egyptian one called Hamis Carpets. And the idea was to get orders, export orders. Now this was, this seemed like, the, you know, the, they got an Italian designer to design carpets. They made all kinds of, of uh, you know, agreements. And then it was just, you know, the aid to artisans is a reasonably respectable organization. It goes to trade fairs. It 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 sort of shows its products. It's uh, and it tries to get orders. Um, and I think the experience of that was that it took a very long time uh, before anything happened. So they were kept trying, showing their products. You know, people looked at them, said thank you very much, but. You know, it took seven attempts to get one order. It just took a long time and a lot of effort to get one order. Um, what was, why was it so difficult? And it turns out that uh, the intuition I was providing before is in, in some ways uh, less compelling than you might have imagined. And the, the intuition I was providing, I'll come, come back to this a little bit. Uh, was that, you know, if you have, if China's um, labor is more expensive than Egypt's labor, then Egypt should produce labor intensive products. That's sort of the f basic uh, logic that we've been talking about for a while now. Now the problem with that logic is that even though uh, the, it's true that the labor costs are lower, labor costs actually have pretty small part of the total cost of a product, even in a labor intensive product. The reason is a uh, total price of a product. The reason is that the, the buyers really care about quality. So you know, think about, you know, a buyer in the US who buys a blue shirt, uh, um, which is, looks beautiful, uh, puts it in the wash and the blue bleeds and all the other white shirts turn half blue and you know, everything's ruined. So, you know, the first thing you want is a guarantee that the colors don't fade. And that's, a, that's the kind of thing that it, you could, it could be a dollar cheaper, but if it ruins, you know, 10 of your beautiful clothes when you wash it, then that's not, that's not acceptable. So you have to have, you have to be confident that the product is not going to, you know, run, fade. Uh, you know, you don't want your, you know, your, uh, you know, your trousers to bust while you are at work. You, just, you want your clothes to be durable, that you want you know, the color to be fast. And, though, and uh, if you are in the garment industry, it's key that you are on time. Uh, because if you, in the US at least, uh, the newspapers bring out somewhere in February or March, the 
uh, you know, big uh, department stores in the old days at least used to advertise uh, their spring lines. And the spring lines are different from the winter lines and different from the fall lines. So that you know, and those spring lines are clothes that are designed for the spring, lighter, and those clothes need to be, once they advertise it, they need to be in the store. So if you are not a reliable supplier, then, and you say, oh, it's going to be in six weeks, then spring is gone. And so you can't, you can't rely on, on a producer. If you can't rely on a producer, you can't buy uh, t-shirts from them. Or you, because these have short seasons, the summer dress is not going to be useful in the winter. So you, you better get the, the things there on time. And therefore, if I don't trust you, I'd rather pay a dollar more to a Chinese producer who has been supplying reliably than the Egyptian producer who I don't know. And that's, that's a major barrier to trade. Um, so the, the, the results uh, eventually look positive. So exactly as this theory would predict, what has to happen, and what happens actually, is that as this relationship uh, is established, the relationship grows, with, and with it, the quality grows. So the, once you accept an order, you actually are pretty interventionist. You go to these uh, producers and you tell them, look, I would like uh, better uh, this and better stitches, more, more, you know, tighter knots, etc. And you, when you tell them that, you you might have to actually bring someone to show them how to do it. And through that process of exporting, quality does go up, and you you do see orders growing as well. So you see all exactly the story of I'm suspicious of the quality. I'm not going to give them a big order. I'll let's check the quality, make sure it's right, then they get the big order. So that process seems to happen. There's a nice randomized control trial which shows that and quality does go up. And uh, the, the problem remains that you know, you, you, have to, um, you have to get a start. So this what was key here is that the aid to artisans eventually got them a chance, then everything started to fall into place. But it, if nobody gives you a chance, if nobody opens the door to you, then in some sense, how do you learn to do it? How do you learn to export? So that's sort of a, like a, you can be in a kind of a vicious circle where nobody gives you a chance, therefore you never show your products, therefore nobody knows about you. And then you might have the best product in the world, but you couldn't sell it. So that's, 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 a, that's a reason why you know, it's much harder to penetrate markets than the idea, it's just the idea that if you're cheaper labor, you can enter labor, labor intensive products. Uh, let me stop there and see if there are any more questions. Yes, so there's a question here. Um, the person is asking if the benefits of free trade are not seen to emerge in, for example, Egypt, but if they emerge in China, then does this mean that trade theory follows political circumstance rather than being a set of natural outcomes? I'm sure it's true that trade theory is influenced by politics. I mean, you think of French in France, the bananas come from French, ex-French colonies. It's not an accident. These are, these are uh, completely, uh, you know, the way, way a lot of these trade deals are cut. There's really 10 possible suppliers and you, you go to one of them because you have to happen to know people there or that it was a fr ex-French colony so somebody came and studied in Paris and therefore you met them. So all these things matter. And in, in, and in the case of China, I think it's been extremely important that China started with uh, a, a very large number of expatriate successful Chinese business people. I think that was very important that they were in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in the US, there were Chinese business people who were already successful, who could bring their connections, who could say, look, I stand responsible for this. I'm going to get it made in Guangzhou, but I will deliver it to you. And that particular fact that they were these people who were, you know, connected to, to both sides. They were connected in China, but also had set up their businesses in Hong Kong and who could therefore stand as the kind of front uh, for this whole process. That was crucial in, in making, making the, uh, making the uh, deals go through. So I, I think that absolutely that is 
history and politics involved in all of these things. Is that all of the story? Probably not. But I, I think it's true that China had a big advantage. It's not an accident that, that India is a country that got into software. There was a lot of Indian software engineers working in Silicon Valley uh, from the beginning of Silicon Valley and that those people all the, brought those skills to India, brought those connections to India. They could say, look, I'll go run the company. You know me, I'll do a good job. And I think those, that's critical. So both history and politics, of course, play a role. And follow following up on this, somebody is asking how much uh, trade flows are determined by labor costs. So the person is referring to the case of Thailand and Vietnam and Cambodia, uh, Cambodia, Cambodia and Bangladesh in the post-China garment industry? So there are, uh, the question isn't where, in some sense, I think that's an excellent question, but I, I want to clarify. So absolutely, it's true that some countries are gaining China is going out of garments and Bangladesh and Vietnam and Cambodia are coming in. That's, that's completely true. What is not necessarily true is that other countries which have, so it's also true that these are countries which had often entrepreneurs who were uh, also established, they had large firms that could take advantage of these opportunities. There was a variety of other, you know, other factors which were not to, nothing to do with labor costs, which were also, I mean, there's also Ghana and, uh, and uh, Niger. And so it's not just that there are many countries with low labor costs. In fact, Bang neither Bangladesh nor Vietnam are among the cheapest countries in the world. They are sort of approaching middle income countries, uh, whereas there, there's a ton of countries in West Africa which do not export uh, gar garments. And, uh, that there, there's a reason for it, which is, and that's what I'm trying to suggest. One reason is that they, you know, if they came and said, we'll do it cheaper, people won't trust them necessarily. That's the argument I'm making, at least. And then some people are wondering about the very big questions. So somebody is asking if the financial market system is not efficiently allocating resources and firms are not innovating, does this undermine the concept of free market economics? And somebody else is asking how these straight questions um, make you think about plant economy versus free market economy? So I, 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 I would say that, you know, I think the, this is a point I'll, maybe I'll spend a little bit more time on when we talk about the same kinds of issues in the context of growth. But I think the big, big sort of unknown is whether or not I mean, many of the banks in India are state-run. It's not that the state is out of that. In fact, uh, you know, at least in India, people make the case that public sector banks are particularly stodgy. Now, whether that's true or not, because after all, uh, you know, they don't necessarily, you know, the the private sector banks have niche products and they they are nimble, but they deal with very specific sets of people. The public sector banks are often left holding the rest of the economy and somebody has to finance, you know, large scale uh, finance, agriculture or cotton trade or something. And so it's not clear to me that it's necessarily fair, the comparison, but it's clearly the view that, you know, the public sector will, the planned economy will do better in these things is prima facie not true. I mean, you, you see the, the public sector banks are, you know, they're less nimble, less profitable, less able to enforce, uh, you know, repayment of loans than private sector banks. So I, 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 that's, a, that's not a full answer to that question, but it says that there's a deeper problem than just ownership of, of capital. I mean, and again, China, uh, for a long time, China is a country where the banking sector is still mostly publicly owned, government owned. And for a while, China had terrible problems of, so one sector where China had real problems was in the banking sector. There was a lot of loans that had to be written off because a lot of con connected people took loans from the banks and then didn't repay. So I, that's, none of that's a full answer to this question, but it's a, it sort of suggests that, you know, the question of how to run an effective financial sector is one that may transcend the private-public pri boundary. Okay, so I'm more, so I, I want to sort of um, plant a word here, which is that 
What we are really talking about in the context of the Egyptian firms was reputation. Firms were didn't have the right reputation, therefore they didn't have the uh, people didn't trust them to produce. And basically, uh, the fa fact that um, you know the products are are uh, you know once they go wrong, it takes a you know they can have disastrous consequences. You know your order doesn't open uh, arrive on time. You can't your spring line is not ready, you can't sell it, you, you are completely, you know, your competition wins. So, given that kind of fragility, it may well be that, uh, you know, you only go to trusted people, the word reputation is something that shows up there. So, now, we, many, many years ago, we um, studied the Indian software industry in the late 90s. This is uh, when the, the industry was still young. Uh, but there were still older and younger firms and what is on this graphic is sort of on the horizontal axis is the age of the, of, or the year of founding. So on the right are the newest firms, on, on the left are the oldest firms. What this curve represents is the contract they get when they produce customized so software. Customized software is a, so a software that, you know, is designed for a particular firm. So, a particular firm uh, come from the US says, can you update my accounting system? That's the kind of thing that is uh, done by customized software firms. The, when they ask you to update your, their accounting systems, uh, you say, okay, fine, give me a contract. And the typical contract uh, can, uh, is either of one or two kinds. One is a, what is called a time and material contract, which is I'll just tell you how many hours it took me to do it. On the other side are the are the uh, what are, are called the fixed price or fixed cost contracts. These are contracts where I say I'll pay you a thousand dollars and you do it. And you can see exactly uh, where. So the problem with software is that you the contracts uh, cover only a small part of what, what is about to happen. Once you start making the software, you discover, oh my God, it's more complicated than I thought. It's going to, and you know, and your client says, oh, I told you that it's more complicated than you thought. Why didn't you listen to me then? And I said, you never told me and so on. There's lots of disagreement. The question is, who pays for the disagreement? When it turns out that it was going to cost 50% more than we estimated, who pays for it? So, under a time and material contract, the buyer pays for it. The foreign buyer in this case was paying for it. In the fixed cost contracts, uh, it's you pay who pay for it. You absorb all the losses. And what this graphic shows is that the younger the firm, the more it's supposed to absorb the losses. This, uh, what's on the, on, on the uh, uh, vertical axis is the, is the uh, contract, where you, whether you have a fixed cost contract or not. If you're born in 97, 100% of these firms had a fixed cost contract. If you were bar, born you know, 10 years before, it was closer, closer to 50%. So it's, it's a very much a matter, of, and this is what you'd expect. You'd expect that I don't trust you, so if you screw up, it's your problem. Uh, I tr if I trust you a lot, I'll say, okay, fine. Uh, I'll, I'll take care of the problem if, it's, uh, if there is, because I know you're a good guy and you, you do, do your best. And so if you do your best, I don't have no reason to punish you. So th that's, that's what you'd expect and that's what you find. And in, indeed, as a result, the, the, soft, uh, the youngest firms absorb the highest proportion of the overrun, the extra extra costs that were generated because the you know the the originally planned contract wasn't quite the right one. When that happens, the older firms they get they don't pay for all of it, and they shouldn't probably because a lot of this come from the buyer's fault, but. It's when it's app, but whether whose fault it is doesn't matter when you're a very young firm, you pay all of it. You just basically absorb losses for a long time and through the process of absorbing losses, you establish that you are actually a reliable person because you know once you, once you 
delivered a good contract, a good outcome to a firm, it says, okay, fine, these guys are reliable. Next time I'll give them a time and material contract. And that's indeed what we find. So that's all that's to say that, you know, in even in software, which happens to be one of these industries where, you know, you could start it with uh, in a garage with uh, famously with uh, uh, two laptops, even in an industry like that, there is a entry cost. You can't just start and because you, are, uh, you have the lowest cost, you can't become a good producer. And the reason why you can't do that is because uh, you are, you know, you, you have to still establish your name and establishing your name means losing money for a while. And that's what all these firms do. And that's a general, uh, that's uh, sort of a g general point is that, you know, we, we, uh, we uh, notice in the world that uh, you know, lots of clustering, lots of, you know, certain kinds of garments are produced in parts of northern Italy or in one town in India called uh, Tirupur or in Dhaka in Bangladesh. And th that's, a, there's, that's also partly because of this reputation. It's because uh, it's, uh, you know, these, well, once you go there, you find out not just that, you know, this firm, you, once one firm uh, becomes well known, uh, you can sort of say, okay, well, but they are, if he, they can do it, maybe the one next door can as well. And you investigate them. So you, the, you see spreading between, lo within localities. And that's all, also because, you know, certain places then acquire sort of, uh, you know, there's the toy capital of China where a huge proportion of the world's toys are made. This is the kind of thing that happens because, you know, you, you, you the information is such a valuable part of your uh, of your capital. You, the, you know, when I when I have the when you, you have information about me, you trust me, and but you might also therefore start uh, trusting my neighbor, my friend, my cousin, etc. So you get a, a lot of network based spreading, and that's one of the reasons why if you are a if you are a random country that doesn't have a network right now, uh, it's that much harder. It's a, if you are Sierra Leone and you want to enter the garment production, you are competing against somebody's established reputation, somebody who has already a name for themselves and you're competing against that. Um, the last observation I want to make is that, that this is probably one reason why the inequality effects are the way they are. Uh, the, you know, the reason why inequality goes up with trade is that it's not everybody who can take advantage of trade. It's the people who can build a reputation. People, so in India, uh, for example, or, or in Mexico, it was often the, the skill premium went up. The, the earnings of the people who had a good education went up. That's probably not accidental. They were the ones who went to the good schools, who, who's, who either went to the US to work in the software industry, or their cousins worked in the software industry, or their, or their friends from university worked in the software industry in the US. And that means that those people, people who had better education, benefited a lot more from from trade. And that's one of the reasons why inequality goes up is that it, you need to be a bit, you know, connected to the world. Maybe you need to speak English, you need to be, uh, you know, slick in the way you make your PowerPoint presentations, etc. Those skills you learn in a particular educational context and those help you e penetrating this reputation barrier. So it's these, all, all of these facts are sort of small clues to what's going on. I wouldn't claim that I've demonstrated that this is what the big problem is, but it, it makes me think that uh, the, when you put them together, you start to see a pattern that, you know, this is maybe a story that explains why the, the usual narrative of trade isn't quite right. Which then um, brings us to the, I think the hard question, the, the sort of the worrying question, which is, you know, the promise of trade is that we will sort of have a ladder. We'll have China going first, then Bangladesh, then Sierra Leone, etc. And there is some evidence of that. You know, Bangladesh is taking a little bit of China's place in the ladder, so it's not entirely false. On the other hand, we need to worry that maybe, uh, maybe it's happening very slowly. And the reason you might worry about that is that if you think that were the case I made, that reputation is cr critical, which means uh, then, you know, unless I trust you, 
it's always going to be hard to get you, be, me to switch away from you. And so your costs have to go up a lot before I, I get out of uh, producing, uh, buying from China. It's your cost, even if your cost was a 20% higher, maybe I'll still take it because it's just so much more com comfort. It's reliable, I know them, I know that they can deliver, etc. So that, that's, a, that, that, that's accentuated by the fact that a huge part of uh, products, a product, uh, the price of a product is actually uh, not, not labor. And in particular, for example, most countries in the West have compliance requirements. You have to be certified that you have not used this kind of input that's banned and that kind of input that's dangerous for all good reasons. I mean, you know, I, I'm not uh, arguing against those. But those things need to be, so many products, for example, there are com companies in Germany who will basically, all they'll do is they will take, buy a product from some country, from Vietnam, and then check that that product is actually what it claims to be and certify it. And certification often is as much of the cost of the product as labor. So, you know, even though labor is, seems to be, you know, you're making a labor intensive product, you pay so little to labor uh, that in a sense labor costs are actually a very small part of the price of a product. The reason why that's important is that if the gains are going to come from my having lower labor costs than you, but labor cost is only 10% of the price of the product, then you know, even if my labor cost is 50% of yours, you just save 5% of the price of that product. And 5% is not going to make me switch. So it really needs to be that I, I can do some of the other things. I have the right connections. Somebody's willing to say that this product is reliable, etc., so that I can compete. So those these other pieces of the of the cost, the marketing cost, the certification that this is actually, you know, the product is actually good quality, all of those things, those things are, have to be aligned or else it's just very hard to enter the market. And that makes me maybe less optimistic about the, the global narrative of expanding trade. Uh, I'm going to uh, take some questions now and then come back to the, the question of, you know, what does this mean, for example, for a big, uh, you know, big economy like the U.S.? Um, so we have one question. Uh, in what ways can free trade be used to boost regional economic development in, in sub-Saharan Africa? Um, and then we have uh, questions on reputation. So do you think the reputation of a country's firms also depends on social factors such as prejudice against that specific country or its people. And um, one person is asking, um, so it appears that sociological phenomena, so reputation, trust, clustering, connections, as you mentioned, uh, have a big impact on trade. And uh, how can this be factored into models of trade or defining trade policy? So on the, on the regional, I mean, I think that there is a lot of attempts to do that, um, meaning, you know, you try to get south-south trade in general. And so there is a, this has been an idea that's been around for a long time. And there is a fair amount of south-south trade, uh, let's say between India and, and Bangladesh, there is fair amount of trade. But I, I would say that in general, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, partly, I mean, many of these countries still recently were just very poorly connected. You would have to, to fly from one place in West Africa to another. You often had to fly to, you know, to uh, Addis or to, to Paris and then fly back to that place. So there were just poor connections. So I think establishing connectivity is important. And probably it's also the case that these countries are fairly similar. And that's part of the problem is that very similar countries trade less than more, more diverse countries. So I think both of those are, I mean, that's uh, controlling for many things. So in, in Europe, within Europe, there's a lot of trade within Europe, but Europe is also extraordinarily well connected. So you know, it's easy to send something from Germany to France. So I think that establishing connections is going to be a big part of that. On the reputation questions, yes, I think that, you know, I, th I think that these are going to be, uh, the social factors are important. 
I suspect that countries do make an effort to manage their collective reputation. So countries do worry about the fact that, you know, their image is important. I think uh, India right now must be worrying that, you know, uh, these, this sort of vaccine disaster is going to undermine their ability to, to sell you know, non-vaccine things because, you know, people don't somehow the general confidence in the country might be undermined. So I, th I think these are all real concerns. Um, what can, and I think that uh, that's sort of what, uh, what this uh, attempt in this uh, randomized control trial of trying to sell carpets to Egypt was trying to do, was to undo the basic prejudice that Egypt is not a country that produces carpets. So there was an attempt to make, make that uh, more, uh, you know, make it m sort of more fluid by sort of this, these inter intervening NGOs where basically they were trying to do is say, look, we'll take, take our word for it, they're good at it. And so it, it takes a lot of effort, but I think that's maybe the only way we'll, that plus you know, maybe some entrepreneurs. I mean, one thing that's happening interesting in Africa is a, some amount of Chinese investment is happening. Some of it is happening in infrastructure and there's a belt and road connection there. But I think there is also a fair amount of investment. I've seen Chinese factories in Liberia. And I, th I think those factories are actually um, employing local labor to produce products. So I, I, I do think that maybe there will be entrepreneurs who will be willing to put their name on it and say, look, you know, our product is good. You know our product is good and now we're going to produce it in Africa. That's, that's maybe one way it's going to happen. And then Liberian entrepreneurs hopefully will imitate that and use the same, you know, the spillovers from that. Once you, people are convinced that Liberia can produce, um, I don't know, uh, toys, then maybe other Liberian entrepreneurs will also jump in. That's the hopeful scenario. Okay, my last uh, 15 minutes, let me talk about the US. So. I mean, this graph was already up once, and I should, but I want to emphasize that. I mean, the U.S. has lost market share to China. This is sort of a very clear fact. Now, this is two facts, really. One is that world trade has grown, and the other is that China has grown much faster than world trade. So bo both of those things have happened. Um, uh, U U.S. has lost um, about 40 percent of its uh, market share, and China now is bigger in world trade than the U.S. ever was. So it's, it's really a, a major reversal. Um, and one of the consequences of that is that manufacturing in the U.S. has shrunk. 600,000 jobs is the number people give. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not, this doesn't mean that all jobs have disappeared. Of course, these people, U.S. unemployment rates are very historically low in the, uh, in the recent uh, in recent years, partly because there are lo actually lots of jobs not in, uh, you know, in not in manufacturing but in other sectors. Partly because uh, maybe less encouragingly, U.S. labor force participation has been dropping. People are w walking out of the labor force. Now, one thing that um, uh, is uh, sort of we, we, we can go back to the samuelson stolper theorem and say that what should this imply for a country like the U.S.? And there the prediction is again that, um, uh, again, relatively straightforward. U.S. is a country where labor is relatively scarce and capital is relatively abundant and skills are relatively abundant. So low skilled labor should lose. So that, that, that's the prediction. Uh, and the question is more, do, to, what ex, to what extent do, does it happen? And uh, again, the strategy for looking at it, the way we want to, so if you just look at places there where um, you know, firms shut down and say, well, this is a result of China, that probably doesn't give you something very reliable because you don't know who, how do I know what would have happened if China hadn't happened? But you could look at basically areas that produce products that China is, you know, specialized in, and compare them to places that where where which produce products where where China, even at the beginning, really 
never was very big and, and so you can look at the rise of China as a shock to places, places that were producing products that were particularly, uh, you know, China was particularly specialized in are going to be hurt more than the other places. So that's, and you can see that there's variation in that. The, you can see that the colors vary by how much, what are areas where uh, the Chinese um, product mix is particularly, uh, particularly salient. Those are the dark areas or places where they're less salient. Um, are lighter colors. So it's, a, it's, it's very much uh, sort of the kind, you can see that there are lots of variation, lots, some places really got hurt by China, other places quite near them when much less affected. So you could actually compare them and see what happens in those places. And that's what Otto Don and Hansen do. This is exactly like the Topalova st uh, strategy. And what they find is that, um, uh, when you when you have um, places that were more exposed to Chinese exports uh, lose um, uh, lose manufacturing employment, so it's it's uh, sort of what you'd expect in a sense, but if, but the magnitudes are are, are large. Um, uh, I, sorry, uh, magnitudes are large. Uh, they're uh, and why I'm going to emphasize this, they were predictable. We knew. You remember uh, we just said uh, right at the start that trade is beneficial when you redistribute. The places where China uh, expanded, where China uh, were places that uh, we knew that China will expand because they were the products that China was have, was producing all along. These were pretty places of producing furniture and toys and things like that. And those places would we would knew they would be hurt, but somehow that didn't translate into a response. And that's that's key. That you would imagine the theory says yes, some places will benefit. Places that are selling soybeans to China will benefit. Uh, will uh, places that therefore places that are selling, on the other side, places that are selling furniture to, uh, are going to lose because Chinese will dominate the furniture market. So you want to compensate the people in the furniture areas. And you could have done that because we kind of knew where this is happening. But uh, we could have planned it. It was predictable by, based on China's specialization before it joined WTO before it joined the World Trade Organization, before it expanded its trade, you could have predicted where this would happen. And uh, the sad fact is that we will see nothing was done. Okay, so what this did, so this is a country, a city called Martinsville in, in uh, I think in North Carolina. And here, um, you know, 41% were in furniture and knitwear. Um, by 2018, uh, that number had dropped a lot. A lot of people had um, lost their jobs. The work, interesting fact is that the fraction of working age population with a job went from 73% to 53%. That's 20% of the people had no jobs. Now, one thing you might say that why didn't they leave? Why are they still there? And the answer is that's the sticky economy. People don't leave. Um, the reaction, interestingly, was, I mean, these people were unhappy, not surprisingly, and it, was, it turned out that this, the, this place that lost, like, I think, for the highest fraction of jobs of all, every place in India due to the Chinese, uh, Chinese exports were also the places where the morphine sales prescriptions went up the fastest. So the, the response was to solve the problem was to give them opioids. And you, as you might know, there's an epidemic of, opi of, epi of op opioids in the US from which uh, a large number of people have died. What didn't happen is on this slide. 
This is what should have happened. As I was saying, we should have given money to people who are predictably going to lose because you are gaining elsewhere. That was the whole idea of trade. You gain from selling more soybeans, you, you lose from selling less furniture, you compensate. Uh, so the total, uh, you know, a thousand dollars in increase in US imports for, uh, per worker meant a worker lost $549. So when China, you import a thousand dollars from China, you lose the workers lost $549. What did they get in compensation? Well, they got $3 from TAA. TAA is a program that's supposed to compensate, the trade adjustment allowance. That program exists, but it was basically not used. What was used was the, the workers were actually encouraged to become uh, disabled and, and take, get health benefits. They got some health benefits and they got some disability benefits. They were often just encouraged to say that you claim you are disabled and we'll give you some compensation. So what happened was instead of saying, look, it's not your fault. You lost because of trade. We'll compensate you. He said, look, you're, you, you know, I can't help you, but if you want to pretend to be disabled, we'll accept that and we'll give you some money. So even with all that, they got about a 10% 10 10 of the benefit. The, what they lost was $549, what they gained was $58. So it's a 10% compensation. So really very little compensation. Um, especially hurts males. As a result, you get all the symptoms of, in a sense of a society where you know, things are breaking down. For example, uh, out of uh, wedlock, birth of children went, goes up, uh, marriages go down, um, you know, partly because men are no longer able to sustain families and so on. And tragically, these are areas where the deaths, what are what Angus Deaton and Case and Case or and, Case and Angus Deaton call uh, deaths of despair go up. They are, these are deaths from opioids, suicide, um, violence, etc., and these go up in exactly the areas where the China shock hits. So the the, the, the China shock generates um, losses in jobs that turn, turn, translates into uh, increases in deaths in an age group where there were very few deaths before, 50, 45 to 54. That's and as a result. In 2018 was the first year, I think, after, I think, 1919 in the Spanish flu, that U.S. white population actually fell. It's an interesting moment. It's not, it's not happening to other communities, happening to white. Uh, and I'll come back to that point later. Uh, this is related to then extreme opposition to Mm, you know, there's a sense. This is often blamed on politicians, and and the support for Trump is strong in exactly these places. Uh, you you support Trump because he says that he'll do something for you, um, and uh, to, to f I'm going to say this quickly because it's sort of maybe complicated to explain, and. It's not clear that the gains overall, given the political consequences, were enormous. The, and the reason they're not enormous, so our colleague Arno Costino with Andres Rodriguez Claire has tried to estimate how much U.S. gains from trade. And the reason why that's, uh, the U.S. is unlikely to gain a lot from trade is U.S. is a huge economy, so it can produce everything. And it does produce everything. So the you know overall gains from trade for in the U.S. are pretty limited, um, as against, for example, uh, in Belgium, where you know 30 percent of the economy is traded, and if they stop trading, they would really lose. So it's it's a you, the U.S. is a large economy; it can afford to be relatively closed. And so the gains from trade are, you know, uh, they estimate they're somewhere between one percent and four percent of GDP. So not enormous gains from trade and we and as a result uh, you know the trade-offs uh, that the US took the amount of inequality generated uh, don't necessarily look an, like an obvious win and that's not to say that we should not have trade 
trade is extraordinarily beneficial to many countries. But you, I think I, I think it's very important to be mindful of the fact that you know this was not that all boats were lifted very fast. It was a, a setting where, in fact, many of the boats didn't get uh, kind of got submerged in this process. It was not that. It was not that. The economy just did so much better from trade that everybody benefited, even though some people lost their jobs. It is really that many people, abs in absolute terms, lost out because of trade, and in fact, many of them took their own lives. So I think that that thought, uh, that slightly so with that slightly sobering thought, let me take some questions, and uh, I'll and we'll come to a, a new topic. Somebody is wondering about the potential downsides of redistribution. So the person is asking if by redistributing, we are risking to discouraging the winners to continue trade. And then another person is asking about the political consequences of what you just showed us. And she wants to know whether this validates the hypothesis that economic despair drove white US Americans to Trump and right-wing extremism. And following up on this, she's asking if protectionism would actually improve the conditions of the working class in the US? Um, so on the, on the first question, I would say let's wait. We have a whole section on, on redistribution. Let me, let's talk about redistribution when we come to that. On the second question, uh, yes, I think there's, you can predict Trump vote shares by China shock, the same shock we were looking at, uh, the shock on you know where, which areas were more exposed to China trade, which could be predicted to be exposed to China trade. So absolutely, uh, it drove them to Trump towards right right wing extremism. Would it be solved by protectionism? Not obvious, because uh, it's what what would happen, especially if there's countervailing tariffs. Is a lot of a lot of the I mean the Chinese. Uh, threatened if the U.S. were to to intervene, they would not buy agriculture from uh, agricultural products from the U.S. So a lot of farmers would be the next set of victims. It's not clear to me that that battle is the right one to win. It seems much more natural to compensate losers than to than to try to win it by uh, protecting. I'll stop there. Thank you.